One of the nicest things about teaching journalism in high school or college is the fact that you have a lot of wonderful students around you. I would like at this time to introduce a Ball State journalism student who has something to say to you, Miss Sharon Schrader. Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to Eastern Indiana Journalism Day. We hope that you have a real nice time today. We have a lot of activities planned for you, so let's get started. I'd like to introduce to you now the Ball State University Singers, directed by Mr. Don Nguyen, who will entertain us all for several minutes. Thank you. Judy Mays from Dunkirk, would you go out to the registration desk? I think there's a message for you there uh, right away. There are several people located in our audience whom I'd like to introduce to you. I might even ask some uh, to come up on stage for just a moment. Uh, otherwise, will these people stand and wave and keep standing until everybody that I name stands, and then you can applaud for all of them. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, have Mr. Robert Shupp, who is Executive Secretary of the ISSPA, stand. Next, uh, Mrs. Barbara Baines from Southwestern High School, who is Vice President for Student Affairs if she is here. Then Miss Gloria Schrader from Columbia City High School, who is secretary. James Ray from Indianapolis, Ben Davis, who is a member of the board. Mrs. Sally Earle from Indianapolis Shortridge, who is historian. Some students, Joe Blatt from Indianapolis Shortridge, our student president. Joy Hennard from Warren Central High School, the, our student vice president. Helen Hall from Indianapolis, Arlington, our student secretary. Then Dean Spiker from Highland High School, who is one of the co-directors of the Northern Indiana Journalism Seminar. And Richard John from Griffith High School, who is the other co-director for the seminar. There are some students, too, from Northern. Uh, Linda Cusmall from Griffith High School is uh, Miss Ann Corb from South Bend High S Central High School here too. Uh, Eastern District, which is this one, Miss Frances Halberstad from Newcastle Chrysler High School, uh, faculty representative, and Miss Linda Clark from Muncie Central, who is student representative. There are two John Boyds, one from Indiana State University and one from Evansville College from the Western and Southern District. There are some students involved in those districts, Daryl McGlone from Terre Haute Gerstmeyer, Patty Light from Terre Haute Gerstmeyer, Jean Neidnagel from Evansville Harrison and Randy Shepard from Evansville Harrison. There are several people who have worked as a member of a planning committee for this session. Uh, they include Edgar Henderson from Muncie Central, Mrs. Kay Richards from Lawrence Central, Mr. Keith Wellman from Fishers, Miss Ann White from Fort Wayne Southside, Mr. Frank Wuschitz from Anderson High School. Uh, would you applaud for these people, please?
would uh, our president-elect, Mrs. Marilyn Walker, from the uh, high school at Marion, come forward to the stage and tell us something about IHSPA convention plans. The Indiana High School Press Association is very happy to work with Ball State in sponsoring this Regional Journalism Day. This is one of four days throughout the state this year. Next fall, we will all get together for a state convention at Franklin College. The dates are Labor Day weekend, and we have quite a good convention in store for us next year. The principal speakers for the fall convention will be Senator Birch Bayh and uh, Eugene Pulliam and his wife from the Indianapolis newspapers. We hope that you are making plans now to be with us for this state meeting Labor Day weekend. We might mention that if you do not belong to the Indiana High School Press Association, if your publication does not belong, that you may join through your regional district meeting, or you may join by writing directly to Franklin College, the headquarters of the Indiana High School Press Association. Put Labor Day weekend on your calendar to be with us next fall, and we will see you there. Now, lots of things will happen this summer, quite a few of them with quite a few of you at Indiana University. Could I ask Ms. Gretchen Kemp from the Department of Journalism to step up and tell us a little bit about institute plans for the summer? Dr. Engelhardt, let me congratulate you on turning out for this Eastern Indiana Field Day. It is heartwarming to see so many of you interested in the problems of school communication. We hope that many of you will continue your interest in the field because we do so desperately need good persons in the area of communication. And we hope that one of these years you will be teaching high school journalism and advising publications. <laughs> A word about our summer program at IU this summer. It's really a summer school, two weeks long, six weeks in all for the staff members. We, this will be our 19th summer for the High School Journalism Institute. We feel that it gives you a t an opportunity in the summertime when you are not pressed by your many duties and, uh, acad and other academic work to concentrate on your problems of school publications, to get a lot of your planning done, to exchange ideas and to uh, exchange problems and the solution of problems with youngsters from other schools. The news conference, our first group, which is very small, is primarily for the individual. The individual who has a sincere interest in communication, who may be serving as a correspondent for his community newspaper or radio station, or who may be a second, an associate, or an assistant editor on his school publication. That one begins before too long, on June the 27th, and runs through June the 10th. The second workshop is for newspaper editors and business managers only, two from a school as a maximum. And the third one is the yearbook workshop where we will work with your book editors, your book business managers, your book photographers, and then assistant or associate editors in the area of copywriting and editing. We'll be very happy to be seeing some of you there. I'm sure we shall, because when I left the office yesterday afternoon, the registration cards were piling up, but we already had more than 60 schools enrolled for 
uh, one session or another of the workshop. Thank you, Dr. Engelhardt. No, no. Uh, don't applaud yet because I want to tell you something about uh, Miss Kemp. Last night at the Journalism Honors Banquet, it was my privilege to award a Ball State University Journalism Honors Certificate to Miss Kemp for making the outstanding contribution to Indiana High School journalism. I thought you'd like to know that. Now, applause. I uh, think that uh, we had better proceed because during the next 40 minutes you're going to be highly entertained by a tremendous speaker who will do a good job for you. Uh, may I suggest this, that uh, as we bring the introducer of the speaker to the platform, uh, Dr. Paula Pella, that as many of you as possible scoot around over in some of these seats this way because you'll want to see what the speaker is up to. Uh, Ms. Palatella, would you come forward while they're doing that? Now that I've had my calisthenics for the day, it's my pleasure to introduce Mel Lazarus to you. Time Magazine, in the issue of April 9, named the comic strip Miss Peach as one of the great new comic strips in the country. Time described it as having, quote, megacephalic, super sophisticated school tots who show up their elders' ignorance. So you're going to enjoy what Mel has to say about these things. Miss Peach is seen in the Indianapolis News and 200 other newspapers around the country. It is distributed nationally by the Newspaper Publishers Syndicate of Chicago. Her creator is Mel Lazarus, who will tell you all about her on this drawing board that we've provided on the stage. But before he brings Miss Peach into the auditorium, let's hear something about him. Mel is a native-born New Yorker who began drawing cartoons at the age of 16. So there may be a, another Miss Peach creator in the audience today. Miss Peach was born at age 30. In between, Mel served in the Navy in 1945, and then for five years, he was art director and editor of children's and semi-slick magazines. He published his first novel in 1964. It was called The Boss is Crazy Too. Right now, he is working on a stage adaptation for David Merrick, who will produce it as a musical comedy. At the same time, Mel is working on a television pilot film for Screen Gems. He has a second play coming along based on the novel or the book, The American Way of Death, which uh, aroused the ire of the uh, funeral director's uh, industry, as you may remember. And this fall, he will be publishing a second novel. In his spare time, Mel Lazarus hobbies with sub-miniature photography and golf. Let's welcome Mel Lazarus. Thank you, Dr. Palatella. That introduction is so lavish, I forgot who he was talking about. Actually, I'm, I'm barely out of high school myself. It's only been a couple of years. A couple of decades, maybe, but what's the difference? And uh, like you do, we had a, a newspaper in school called the Madison Highway. It was published every single week, whether we needed it or not. I worked on the paper in the capacity of nature editor. Now, the, the function of a nature editor on a school newspaper in an urban community such as New York City 
it's kind of limited to say the very least. I mean, how much school nature news could there possibly be? Well, none. After a while, I became kind of tired of not ever filing any copy. I envied the sports editor and the feature writers and the columnists who had bylines every now and then. And I gave it a lot of thought and finally realized that I would have to make nature news if I wanted to get, get my name in the paper. One day, fortune came along in the form of a burst pipe on the first floor of one of the sink clouds. The pipe burst and the water came pouring out. And I saw my opportunity. Now, you might ask, what kind of opportunity is this for nature news? None, really. But I figured that uh, <laughs> for, months, for months, we had been complaining about the, the termite situation in the school. They infested the whole ground floor and the walls and the baseboards. And while they had no direct uh, connection with the bursting of the pipe, the water from the pipe had, had slopped down into these ancient rotting walls that housed the termites. Well, it's beginning to sound more like a nature item. Still not a terribly interesting one. I pondered this. How could I make it interesting enough to get the editor to run it? Well, using my, my great natural sense of the dramatic, and my inborn newspaper man's instincts, I wrote the most exciting news story ever to be submitted to the Madison Highway. The headline read, Million Bugs Rendered Homeless by Flood. <laughs> I was promptly fired by the editor and never saw my name in another newspaper until uh, 1957, when uh, Miss Peak was launched. Now the byline that I craved so much to see as a high school kid runs every day, whether they need it or not, in 210 newspapers. Miss Peak, the comic strip, deals with the rather idiotic adventures of a classroom full of kids who are trying desperately to educate their teachers, just as you are. And I don't think they're making any more progress than you people are. <laughs> teachers are well, they learn slowly. <laughs> now, the fact that, that my comic strip takes place in a classroom or in a school, I call it the Kelly School, is not really important. What is important is that the kids are a group of miniature adults, just as you are, who function in a miniature society all their own. The Kelly School is a, a microcosm of the world at large. I chose the classroom as the background for my comic strip because it offered me the widest latitude in terms of ideas, and also it, it, it forms a set little community within which the characters uh, operate. They never get away from each other. Now, the main thing when you're writing a comic strip or fiction uh, for any medium, as far as that goes, the main thing is to develop uh, characters, good, solid characters with whom the reader can identify, either himself or anyone else he hates. Now, in my case, in the case of my characters, I, I base them all on friends of mine, close personal friends of mine, schoolmates of mine, kids I knew when I went to school, former friends of mine, I say now. <laughs> and with your permission, I'm going to draw some of these characters and tell you a little bit about what makes them tick. In fact, even without your permission, I'm going to do it. First and foremost amongst the characters is, of course, Miss Peach herself. She's the, the, the heroine, the star of the strip. Although, with the passage of time, she's become, I've become weaker. She's become less and less important to the progress of the comic strip. Now, the reason is, well, it's due to a strange phenomenon, which I've, I've noticed, uh, wherein the characters kind of take over, and you have very little control over them as the, as the writer. Miss Peach, through this strange process, has been relegated to uh, rather a supporting role. She's kind of a, uh, a supporting actress. But she does work as a catalyst. In other words, she starts things off. She causes things to happen, and the kids take it from there, and she just sort of retires. And most of the fun that I have, at least, and presumably my readers, uh, is with the kids themselves. I like to draw Miss Peach, if I can remember what she looks like. I've only drawn her, I figured out the other day, uh, 
365 times a year for eight years. I forgot what my figure was. I wasn't a very good math student. But it's a couple of thousand times, I think. And she's, she's changed a little bit, but not substantially. She started with a little ponytail. And it's kind of become a bun over the years. I don't know what that means. And in terms of my unconscious, well, she's very cute. She's kind of sweet. She's the only character in the strip, incidentally, who, who is not based on a real person. Um, Miss Peach is warm and sweet and kind, <laughs> gentle and tolerant. In other words, a complete fiction. Now, I, I, I almost always draw her seated at a desk for two very good reasons. First of all, that's, that's where teachers belong. And secondly, I never, I never learned how to draw feet. Now, as I said, the characters tend to take over your story, and, and they become very, very real to the writer, and they tend also to resist certain things that he might try to do with them. I couldn't make Miss Peach say or do anything uncharacteristic. It, w it just would, be a, a, it would result in a tremendous emotional upheaval. Mine, not hers. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the beginnings of the strip, uh, eight years ago, I did have a couple of characters whom I liked very much, and I thought were going to be important. And uh, one of them was a kid named Freddy, who was kind of bright and a little bit snide, and he would get a lot of good punchlines. And he ran, he only lasted with me for about a year and a half because I introduced a little girl who had the same characteristics. She was snide and clever. But one other advantage, she was terribly nasty. She just uh, reduced Freddy, and he, he disappeared from the strip. And I had very little to do with it. I had absolutely no control over that, in fact. I just found myself writing for Marcia instead of Freddie. I liked her better. Because she was nasty. She's much more interesting. <laughs> now, as I say, because Miss Peach is so nice, she's been relegated to her current backseat position in the affairs of the Kelly School. The real stars of the strip are the kids themselves. Now, when I chose uh, parts of my friends, as I told you before, to incorporate in, into my characters' personalities, I invariably chose the worst aspects of their personalities, because I found that the worst aspects were very often the most interesting and attractive. Take, for example, a little girl I call Marsha Mason. Is that a cat? <laughs> she looks like this. This is her nose, by the way. Don't get frightened. She has two little beady eyes, and generally, um, uh, the curve of the eyebrows, that's a cheap cartoonist trick. It means uh, uh, intense, it, it represents an intense expression. And it has a slightly threatening look, which she usually wears. She's the class tyrant, see? She is what psychologists would, would, would uh, <laughs> she's also got two legs. It's a little early in the day for me, you'll have to forgive me. She is what psychologists would call, if they were speaking clinically, a thinker. <laughs> now, Marcia is based on a real Marcia Mason with whom I went to school. Uh, the real Marcia Mason was, was a, a superiority complex of legs. She was, <laughs> she was completely infatuated with her own magnificence. And, and as a matter of fact, she used to brag that the, uh, the doctor who brought her into the world still dragged her around town as a sample. <laughs> At the age of 10, Marcia was easily the world's most vicious woman. Recently, uh, in, the, in, the, in the comic strip, uh, Marcia walked over to a peace-loving classmate and asked him if he could lend her some money. And he said, no, I'm sorry, I'm broke. Whereupon she hit him in the mouth. <laughs> now, when he recovered, he went to her and said, Marsha, why? You know, what was that all about? Why did you do this? And she said, that was the opening gun in my war on poverty. <laughs> now, another, another character with whom I've had success in terms of reader response is a kid I call Ira. Now, Ira is Marsha's classmate, and he also happens to be her fiancé. I'll explain that one in a few minutes. But he's 
every bit as despicable as she is, but for different reasons. Ira is a coward. He's a class coward. He's a pathological sissy. When I was a kid, uh, we weren't uh, shy or nervous or phobic or aggressive or any of the words uh, they use today. We were just plain yellow. And that, that's, that's Ira's problem. This is what he looks like. You'll notice a distinct family resemblance at this point. <laughs> Even in the feet. The, uh, I'm often asked why I, I put both eyes on the same side of the nose. And, and I never realized there's anything strange about that. <laughs> I mean, he's got two more just like them on the other side of the room. <laughs> anyway, Picasso has been getting away with it for a long time, and, and he's a foreigner, you know. So why shouldn't I? Now, the reader sees Ira and sees him usually quit. Oh, I forgot. He, he, he almost always has a little bead of perspiration on his temple, which uh, denotes tension and fear. Saves me a lot of drawing, you know. The reader sees uh, Ira quivering in the corner with fear, and, and, and he, he instantly recognizes his own superiority, and it makes him feel good. Now, I mentioned that Ira is engaged to Marcia. Now, she won him in a raffle. What happened was, <laughs> it was discovered by the girls that he had a dollar thirty-five in the school bank, and this made him eminently eligible. So they. Uh, organized a raffle and raffled off uh, Ira, and Marsha won. She won because she, she's extremely lucky, and, and she also happened to organize the raffle, drew the winning ticket. So now, of course, she's engaged to him, or they're engaged. Well, she's more engaged than he is, but they're engaged for life and, and, and intend to get married, or she intends to marry him eventually, and she's instructed him in the meantime to get all his affairs in order and to to uh, eliminate all other human relationships from his life. A theory is that by, by the time they're married, 15 years hence, without having had any friends all those years and, or any uh, human relationships, he will have been reduced to a, an empty, simpering, witless hulk of a man. In other words, uh, perfect husband material. <laughs> now, speaking of human relationships, Getting back to Marcia for a moment, she um, frequently conducts in the strip uh, human relations lectures to her classmates. She gets up on a soapbox and speaks gratuitously, and she gives advice. And typical of her advice is uh, uh, in response to a question just about two weeks ago, I think I did this. The kid said, uh, asked her, uh, Marcia, uh, how do you win people over? How do you get people? on your side, and she explained uh, very carefully. She said, uh, always remember as you go through life that, that you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. And then she added, so much for attracting insects. Where people are concerned, threats and beatings work wonders. <laughs> now, while I would personally hesitate to identify myself with any of these characters, Probably uh, the one that I most closely resemble physically is a kid whom I call uh, Skinny Lester. It'll surprise you to learn that I, I used to be very thin. <laughs> it doesn't surprise you, huh? Well, this is what Skinny Lester looks like. <laughs> well, they're all my brain children, you know. There's got to be some resemblance. Now, Lester's a nice kid. He's brave and clean and reverent and loyal and, you know, all the other attributes that we look for in a person. And he's, and he's perfectly lovable. His only problem, as I say, is that he's terribly thin. He's got little toothpick legs. <laughs> See, from the neck up, he looks as good as anybody. Now, you may ask, well, if he's such a nice kid, how come he, you know, he makes it in a comic strip like mine, where, uh, where evidently readers like them because they're, they're nasty? 
Well, the answer is that he also happens to be, as you see, a skinny, emaciated wretch, and he's constantly embarrassed in the comic strip by his classmates. And this also is a kind of a, gives the reader a kind of glow. They feel, again, they feel a little, a little superior and a little secure, a little more secure than they did before they started reading it. They feel, well, I'm a lot better off than he is. When I was a school kid, I went through the same things that I now put Lester through in the strip. It's my way of getting even, and it explains why I'm so well adjusted today. <laughs> now, every class um, has its uh, cerebral giant, its class genius. We had ours uh, in our grade school, elementary school classes. It was not me, incidentally. I know you'll be shocked to learn that. <laughs> but we, we had a kid uh, whose name was Stuart, Stuart Finster, as a matter of fact. And uh, I kind of adopted Stuart for Miss Peach's class, gave him the same name, changed the last name so I don't get sued. Stuart is the type who knows too much for his own good. I'm sure you, you know the, uh, the individual. <laughs> A couple of art lessons wouldn't have done me any harm. And he wears uh, eyeglasses, which, as everyone knows, indicates superior intellect. If it doesn't, I threw out $12, I'll tell you. Because I don't even need him, and I wear him. Now, Stuart uh, had an obnoxious habit. He would answer every question the teacher asked. And what's, what's worse, he would answer, answer the question correctly. For this uh, completely understandable reason, he was ostracized from our little society. He was in his own world. We had very little to do with him. Roundly and thoroughly despised because he was an intellectual, the first intellectual I'd ever met. But no fairness to him, I must say, that he did enjoy one moment of intense popularity every single morning. And that was in what we called uh, the period between the bells. Now, I don't know how they do it now or here, but we would have one bell in the morning to signify the beginning of the school day, and then five minutes later we have a second bell which signaled the beginning of the class. It was during that five-minute period that the, the non-homeworkers, like me, would, would frantically beseech the homeworkers, like Stuart, for a copy of last night's assignment so we could copy it. And he was, well, he would come through after a little coaxing, he deliver us of a long, sanctimonious lecture on the sins of procrastination and not doing your homework, but he did come through. One time, uh, I had a little experience. I don't know if this is terribly funny or not, but I thought it was cute. Uh, I had an experience with Stuart. I didn't do my homework the night before, and I approached him and asked him if I could borrow his copy, and he said, uh, why didn't you do your homework last night? And I said, well, uh, there I was in my room, see, and all of a sudden a fairy princess came down on a golden couch drawn through the air by eight unicorns, and she swept me up and took me off through the air to a magic ball, and we danced and danced and danced all night. And he was fascinated by this, see, he just stared at me. <laughs> he didn't know quite what to make of it, but he, he handed me the homework, and I, while I was busy copying it, he, he said, listen, Melvin, that was my maiden name, he said, listen, Melvin, <laughs> he said, you better have your homework tomorrow. I said, well, sure, Stuart, but, you know, why? He said, because tonight I'm going to dance. <laughs> Now, by all odds, uh, the most popular kid in the comic strip, in, in, in terms of, of male, at least, that I've gotten, is the kid that I call uh, Arthur, Arthur Spence. Before I tell you about him, I'll, I'll, I'll draw him. Now, this is not the same nose. It's slightly different. The others were sort of like this. Arthur's is a little flatter. Now, the reason Arthur is popular is because, well, he's not, he's not a stupid kid. He's just uh, not terribly bright. One of his classmates, 
One of his classmates put it this way, and I think very aptly. He said that Arthur, um, he, he had the same brains as anyone. He was, he was launched properly. He just never quite got in orbit. <laughs> the reason he's popular is, as I say, he, he, everyone feels uh, superior to him. Even I feel smart compared to Arthur, some of the things he's pulled. And he's patterned after a real Arthur with whom I went to school who was even dumber than the comic strip author. So dumb, in fact, that I've had to tone him down in order to make, make him believable. Well, you know the type. He goes to school, but not actively, you know? He, he, he considers himself to be, well, kind of an associate member of the class. He participates, but he never gets involved. For example, on the, uh, on the Glee Club, he, he, he's a, a listener. On the, on the swimming team, he's a non-swimmer. On the track team, he's a cinder scatterer. <laughs> he's there, you know, but he's, he's not really functioning. Uh, the only, only the dramatic society uh, uh, treasured him. Uh, he was the very best azalea bush they ever had. <laughs> the real author, incidentally, uh, back in my youth, I did something which... Uh, I haven't been able to use in the strip because it just is, it, it's just unbelievable, I thought. He was absent from school one day, and on the next day, the teacher asked him to bring a letter from home the following day, to follow that sequence. The following day, he came back to school, handed his teacher a letter. She opened it and read it and turned white. And she uh, said, Arthur, why on earth did you bring this letter from home? What it said was, it was on the, on the letterhead of a department store, and it was addressed to Arthur's mother. It said, Dear Mrs. Strim, uh, we have tried vainly to collect the $355 you owe us for that living room furniture. We're turning the matter over to our attorneys forthwith. Thank you, collection department. She said, Why on earth did you give me this letter? He said, It was the only one I could find. <laughs> Now, what I'd like to do uh, is to use these characters, go back over them and use them, give them all a little bit of dialogue, and use them in a, in a, a typical Miss Peach uh, comic strip situation, so that when we're finished, we'll have a king-sized comic strip. We start, as usual, with Miss Peach. I'm going to need a little, a little prop for this one. I didn't give her enough room on the desk. I'm not even going to tell you what that is. If you can't recognize it, then I will go back to art school. Does anyone know what that is? Huh? Right. Right, it's a birthday cake. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aquarium, a little fish tank. And these are fish. <laughs> now, on th these are plants, and on the plants are little sticky things. There are always little sticky things on the bottom of aquariums. All right, Miss Peach says, and we open her mouth for the purpose. Uh, if you can't read this back there, don't worry, I'll read it to you when I'm finished. Well, how can you read it if I can't write it? Goodness. <laughs> Miss Peach says, these sticky little things are fish eggs, Claire. Now, can I have a volunteer from the audience to come up and hold this after I separate us from the pair? I promise you, you won't be embarrassed or humiliated in any way. Son, you're coming? Fine, thank you. You don't have to wait to be recognized. Just run up. Thank you. Now, I'd like you to take this and stand over there with it. Would you please? On the platform, if you will. Thanks. While I hang myself with this thing. Then Marcia says, um, don't, you know, don't just hold comfortably in front of you. Sort of thing. Thank you. Marcia says, uh,
She says, fish eggs? <coughs> Excuse me, I thought only birds lay eggs. Now, can I have another doctor, uh, customer? Son, thank you. There's only one thing wrong with this beautiful auditorium. There are no, there are no steps to the stage. You've got to go around the block to get on it. Thank you. Now, would you stand to the left of that gentleman? Okay. How's that for a piece of staging, huh? <laughs> Fine, any, any one of you, closest to the aisle. <laughs> Thank you very much, son. Look like the Ohio State basketball team. Huh? <laughs> and Lester says, I'm running out of things that lay eggs. Um, uh, and frogs do too, Lester says. Another well, thank you. <laughs> says, See why we hated him? He says, and so does a certain mammal, the duck-billed platypus. <laughs> That's really what I call volunteering. Thank you very much. And then Arthur, as he very often does, takes the punchline. And we, I think we have a young lady halfway up here for this. Uh, he says... Grammar is not perfect, but what do you want from a kid? He says, really? I had no idea it was getting so popular. <laughs> ah, little lady. Oh, well. You missed the shoe. Thereby hangs a, a king-size comic strip. I'd like, I'd like a hand for these kids. Thank you. Thank you. We're not due for publication until next Monday, so maybe you better sit down and go on.
It's time for awards. <laughs> Today, we have several newspaper and yearbook awards to announce. I have certificates uh, here that you may pick up immediately following this session. Uh, but before we uh, do that, I think that I shall read some of the awards so that you'll know who has been honored by the judges who have examined many entries, many good entries, over the past three weeks. First of all, may I announce the winners of the individual articles that appeared in newspapers in Indiana journalism this year. First, the best feature story category. Will the people who are here please stand and remain standing so we can see you and applaud you when you're all standing? at the end of this portion. Uh, this is an auspicious occasion. So, feature stories, honorable mention, Elliot Engel, Northern Lights, North Central High School. Third place, Julia Wyatt, the Munsonian, Muncie Central. Second place, Susan Woodfill, the Trojanal Highland High School. And first place, Anne McGibbon, the Munsonian. For best column. Third place, David Wilde, the Lancer, Arlington High School. Two second place ones, Tom Broyles, the Munsonian, Muncie Central and Pete Miller, the Munsonian, Muncie Central. And first place, Patricia Gordon, the cub reporter of Lawrence Central. <laughs> the best news story. Third place, Tom Broyles, the Munsonian. Second place, Carol Ewing, the survey of Marion High School. And first place, Joe Blatt of the Daily Echo at Short Ridge. The best story concerning journalism activities in your school. Third place, Gwen Hester of the Daily Echo Short Ridge. Second place, Carol Ewing, the Survey Marion High School. And first place, Diane Dickinson, the Trojanal Highland High School. The next category, the best editorial. Third place, to Deborah Fraley, the Rushlight of Rushville. Second place, Roy Benke, Northern Lights, North Central. And first place, Rick Musser of the Lancer of Arlington. The next category. Best Sports Story. Third place, Tom Berniquick of the Lancer of Arlington High School. Second place, David Jackson of the Jolly Roger, Madison Heights High School. And first place, Phil Buchanan of the Electron, Franklin Community. <laughs> the next category, best news photo. Third place, Paul Jacqua of Portland High School Spirit. Second place, Neil Gifford of the Riparian, Broad Ripple. And first place, Tom Hogan of the Munsonian. The next category, best sports column. Cheryl Ellis of the Millstream Noblesville, third place. Second place, Bob Davidson of the Northern Lights, North Central High School. And first place, Linda Wooten of the Arsenal Cannon, Arsenal Tech High School. The next category, Best Feature 
photo. Third place to Larry Thompson of the Monsonian. Second place, Jerry Kent, the Rushlight of Rushville. And first place, John Hillary of the Lancer, Arlington High School. The best cartoon, third place, John Rush of the Monsonian. Second place, Fred Stark of the Riparian, Broad Ripple High School. And first place, Rick Plummer of the Jolly Roger. Now I would like to uh, uh, she will be here to talk to anyone who wants to talk to her. The next judging contest involved printed newspapers, that's the entire newspaper. The first category is front page layout. Third place goes to the Jolly Roger of Madison Heights. Second place to Northern Lights of North Central High School. And first place to the Monsonian. The next category is for the best newspaper sports section. Third place goes to the Jolly Roger of Madison Heights. Second place goes to the Monsonian of Muncie Central. And first place goes to the Riparian of Broad Ripple. The next category is for the best editorial section. Third place goes to the Manual Booster of Manual High School. Second place goes to the Lancer of Arlington High School. And first place to Northern Lights of North Central High School. The next category is for Best Special Edition. Third place goes to the Monsonian. Second place to the Manual Booster, Manual High School. And first place to uh, Central High School for its sectional brochure. The next category is for advertising. Third place goes to the Monsonian. Second place to the Survey of Marion High School. And first place to the Cub Reporter of Lawrence Central High School. The next category is for newspaper all around layout. Third place goes to Northern Lights of North Central High School. Second place to the repair in a Broad Ripple High School. And first place to the Lancer of Arlington High School. I have a series of special types of newspaper awards, which will be given next. First of all, for junior high school mimeograph newspapers. Second place goes to the Franklin Key of Benjamin Franklin High School, Valparaiso. First place goes to the Hibbard Herald, Hibbard Junior High School of Richmond. We have a certificate for the best elementary school mimeograph newspaper. This is the Junior Eagle of Eagle Township, Zionsville. And now for the junior high school printed newspapers. Second place to the Northside News, Northside Junior High School of Columbus. And first place to the West Lane Highlights of West Lane Junior High School, Indianapolis. For high school mimeograph newspapers. Honorable mention to Ye Old Eagle Review of Eagle Township High School, Zionsville. Honorable mention to the Blotter of Dunkirk High School. Honorable mention to the Grubstake of 
Klondike High School. Honorable mention to Shaving, St. Joseph's Academy of Tipton. Third place to the Eagle of Columbia City Joint High School. Second place to the Devil's Journal, Auburn High School. And first place to the Portland High Spirit of Portland High School. Introducing the second keeper of the certificate, Miss Joanna Harris. Yearbook Award, first category, the best yearbook copy. Third place, the Muncie Central Magician. Second place, the Shadow of Noblesville. First place, the Riparian of Broad Ripple. Best yearbook layout, third place, the Sassanera Rama of Sassina High School. Second place, the Accolade of Arlington High School. And first place, the Riparian. The best unusual picture of the school, third place to the Riparian, second place to the Cauldron, of, and first place to the Northerner of North Central. The best group picture, third place to the Cauldron, second place to the Riparian, and also, first place to the Riparian. The best faculty informal picture, third place to the magician, second place to the accolade, and first place to the Riparian. Best human interest picture, first place, or third place to the episode of Yorktown High School, second place to the Riparian, and first place to the Sassinarama. <laughs> Yearbook division pages, third place to the Sassinarama. <laughs> Second place to the Riparian. And first place to the Shield of Highland High School. Yearbook cover, third place to the Shield of Highland High School. Second place to the Magician and first place to the northerner of North Central. Best sports section. Uh, second place to the Shield of Highland High School and first place to the Riparian of Broad Ripple High School. Yearbook opening section. Third place to the Accolade. Second place to the Sassinarama. And first place to the Riparian. Sports photography. Third place to the Accolade. Second place to the Riparian. And first place to the Accolade. This time I'd like to call Mr. Marvin Reichel, who is chairman of the College of Student Publications Committee to the stage. I did it he coaches way. some things. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Reichel will announce the winners of the name tag contest. And I think that these winners should walk across the stage and I believe he will give you a certificate to take with you. So. High School, Wolf Lake, Indiana, for the most appropriate name tag. Where is Wolf Lake? This 
Sorry, sorry. I find that I have something in common with Mr. Lazarus, uh, bugs and drawing. And I find that uh, when I was in drawing class, the only thing I could draw was flies. Franklin High, Franklin, Indiana. It's, uh, it's the name tag that's the most tactile. It's made of felt. Uh, would you come up and get yours for originality, please? And I have a, an award of merit for Sasina. Their award is the most defensible. <laughs> and I have another award of a merit for uh, Whitewater Fountain High School. For theirs, uh, the least likely to switch. Is uh, Mr. Lazarus uh, nearby? Mr. Lazarus is coming back to the platform to announce the name of the winner of the Miss Indiana Journalism Peach category. And uh, Jim Spar and his Fanfare Five will outdo themselves at this time when the announcement is made. Oh, this is a real pleasure. I understand it took uh, eight judges about four hours to make this decision. I think they picked Miss Universe with a lot less trouble. Uh, it goes to Miss uh, Debbie Shaw. Is she here? Debbie Shaw? Oh, that's too bad. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, it's... Ms. Foister, would she accept this for Ms. Shaw? Thank you. The final group of awards are for scholarships for students who intend to major in journalism next year at Ball State. The journalism faculty of the university will recommend to the university scholarship committee that these scholarships be awarded to the following students. I will read all of their names. Will these students come forward to receive the certificate and stay for a few moments so we can take a picture of them? First, Judy Blaskovich, Highland High School. Second, Cheryl Ellis, Noblesville High School. Next, Susan Ellis, Indianapolis Manual High School. Next, Chris Inman, Lakeland High School. Next, Diane Maple, Richmond High School. 
Next, D. McKinsey, Muncie Burris. Next, Julia Wyatt, Muncie Central. Next, Jackie Harrod, Lebanon High School. And Rochelle Hargis of Lebanon High School. While these people are receiving their certificates, I shall ask the chairman of the planning committee for this day to come forward and present whatever announcements need to be made at this time. Ms. Janet Eberly. Well, my face should be a happy face because I'm the last one you're going to see up here. Today, there are hundreds of people working on various activities for J-Day. When there are that many people, sometimes they're a mix-up, and sometimes some of the people have emergencies that come up so they just can't get to Muncie. The committee will keep an eye on everything and replace speakers or other persons if need be. If the speaker for your workshop session doesn't arrive at the very beginning of the session, just relax and wait a few minutes. Somebody will come to your rescue. We have somebody that will uh, come around to the rooms and check. We might even draft a willing advisor who can handle the subject. Since the advisors have a special refreshment room in the English building, we think we can find them there. If an advisor is interested in volunteering for emergency session leading, please see me immediately after this session. Since we're talking about advisors, perhaps we'd better say something about the advisors' luncheon in the foreign room of the Student Center at 1215. The Indiana State Department of Revenue has sent Mr. Paul Boggs, Assistant to the Sa Sales State Ta Tax Administrator, to Muncie to report on the effect of changes in the sales tax law as they affect school yearbooks. We urge all advisors to attend this luncheon. To the students, we have an announcement. Uh, I am sure, you're, as you're all aware of, from 3.10 to 4 uh, p.m. this afternoon, we're having a J-Day jump. Uh, there will be a record hop and we're going to have a uh, disc jockey there. We're also featuring the beachcombers. Back to the more serious part, however, we would like you to select your workshop and your short courses very carefully. Be prompt in getting to them. Participate eagerly. Be sure you cast your ballots at the commercial exhibitors' tables in the lower lobby. Learn as much as you can and enjoy the day as much as possible. We are adjourned. Thank you.